Professor Klaas, you have the okay. floor. So thank you and thanks to the organizers for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Um, so in, in light of the time, I move straight in the, the topic, the regulation, the court and the concept of the rule of law. Um, but before doing so, um, a few words. So when the idea of linking uh, the funds um, with the rule of law was launched, um, during the previous commission, um, Jean-Claude Juncker said um, this is uh, poison for the continent. And um, I feel that these words are important again in light of what is happening today um, outside the borders of the European Union in the Ukraine. And that has an impact also on our relationships uh, between the member states among themselves in the European Union. So um, I could not leave the Ukraine unmentioned. Um, it's almost as if even this topic of the rule of law becomes so much less important when what is going on in the Ukraine is going on. So anyway, so the topic uh, for me is what do the regulation and the judgments tell us um, on the concept of the rule of law in European Union law more generally? And before doing so, I would like to say a few words very briefly, on the rule of law as such. Obviously, and you all know this is just a reminder, the rule of law is not a new concept in European Union law, right? It, it uh, exists in European Union law, has existed for many, many years in uh, the European Union in many different guises. Right. So the rule of EU law, uh, the rule of law has consequences for the um, reviewability of the acts of the European institutions, etc. But um, more recently, obviously, it has become this key um, value, key principle in the relations between the European Union and the member states. And it's as a requirement for the member states that it has become so central. That's one point. Second, this concept of the rule of law as a condition for being a member of the European Union has become gradually clarified in many ways and by many actors. So in the case of the European Court of Justice, already prior to Article 2 of the EU, the conditions of access to justice, uh, judicial independence, etc., but also by the Commission since the events of uh, 2010 in Hungary started. The mechanism contains um, quite a bit of clarification on what the concept means. The European Court of Justice obviously has, um, and even more so in recent years, contributed to clarifying the requirements that are linked to the concept of uh, rule of law. And of course, obviously, in the <coughs> annual reports of the Commission, there is also a lot of clarification of what is meant by rule of law. Now, all of these actors and all of these documents and have different emphasis on aspects of the rule of law because it's such a rich concept. It contains so many different elements and values. So that's on the rule of law before this uh, regulation. Then the regulation. The regulation is fairly straightforward, it's short, it's um, fairly easy to understand, even if we know that the process of its creation has been so complicated, and it contains a definition of the rule of law. So this is an, an, a novelty, I would uh, say, that there is a definition of what the rule of law uh, means only in the context of this regulation, obviously. Um, now, what do the judgments then tell us? What does the court tell us about the concept of the rule of law in the European Union? Um, and obviously, these judgments are meant to be among les grands arrêts de la Cour de justice um, de l'Union européenne. So it's a, a decision. These are decisions by a full court. Um, 10 member states intervening, alas, only, you know, from one region within the European Union. Um, the, the famous references to the famous other landmark cases are in place, the references to the other grand uh, principles and values of European law. So what the court is doing in this judgment, it's one of these judgments in which it is weaving the tapestry of the European constitutional principles, bringing everything together um, um, in, in, in one document again. Um, secondly, on the other hand, the judgments are not a surprise. Um, we all saw the decisions coming. What is interesting is, of course, the emphasis that the, the, the court puts on a number of issues. One, 
especially mainly on the importance of the concept of the rule of law, but also of all the other values contained in Article 2, which are um, referred to as belonging to the very identity of the Union. But secondly, also, I feel the emphasis on the fact that rule of law conditionality and um, the horizontal conditionality is focused, is limited, is restricted to certain types of um, breaches of the rule of law that affect the budget of uh, the European Union. So first and foremost, this regulation is not a rule of law instrument. It's an instrument that is meant to protect the Union budget, even if it is protecting the budget through the rule of law, but it is not protecting the rule of law um, the, um, mainly. Um, of course, because because of the basis. So what has uh, does the judgment tell us more about the rule of law? Um, and I will uh, develop this in the minutes that I have left on the basis of the arguments of um, the Hungarian and the Polish governments, because their claims are all rebutted by um, the court. And that tells us about how we should understand um, the uh, rule of law and uh, the values of Article 2. First and foremost, the objection of the uh, Hungarian and Polish governments was um, Article 2 is not meant to be um, a legal obligation. It's meant to be only aspirational, only political. Um, these, this does not contain binding uh, obligations. That is an argument that the court uh, rejects. Uh, very clearly, um, Article 2 is not merely a statement of policy guidelines or intentions. It contains values um, which are an integral part of the very identity of the Union. So these are foundational values. Um, they um, give, are given expression in principles, and these principles contain binding obligations. So it seems as if the court, almost in legal theory type of, of structure, says you have values, and these values are expressed more clearly in principles. These legal principles are binding, and they contain concrete obligations imposed on the member states. So that is the first objection that is rebutted. Article 2 is clearly binding. Now, obviously, this raises questions for all the other values that are mentioned in Article 2, because the rule of law has been clarified mostly, has been mostly developed, but there is other concepts in Article 2 as well. Eh? So there is a the concept of democracy, for instance. How is that going to be developed? So that is, I think, the, the big question after uh, the judgment. <coughs> Secondly, Hungary and Poland claims that um, it's impossible to give a uniform interpretation of the rule of law. Why? Because of the principle of um, the duty of the European Union to respect national identities. All the member states give different, um, um, are, have different ways of giving effect to the rule of law. So it's impossible to then uh, impose these obligations that the, the state sh should look like this or that. Um, this is something that has sometimes led to confusion, but in fact, it's very simple. Um, Article 4.2 of the uh, TEU does indeed allow for a certain uh, discretion to the member states in, as to the, the, the form in which the rule of law is given shape within the country. But um, it is an obligation um, as to the result that needs to be achieved. And here there is no diversity. So the rule of law needs to be respected. Uniform obligation for all. The way in which that is done, there may be diversity there, but the level of uh, protection needs to be the same. So that too is rebutted. Third, um, the Hungarian and Polish government said that you cannot define in a regulation a value of Article 2. There is no legal basis for that. Um, and moreover, if you define the concept of the rule of law in one sector, then you threaten the concept as a common value of EU law. That too is rebutted um, by the court. The court simply says, well, this is not the general definition of what the rule of law means. This is simply a definition of the rule of law only for the purpose of this regulation. It's not an exhaustive de definition of the concept, only the uh, definition of the concept that is needed for this conditionality 
it does not threaten um, uh, the rule of law as a common value. And there is a legal basis to do it in this context, simply under Article um, 322.1a. Fourth, there is also this um, the, the objection by the uh, Hungarian and Polish governments saying that you cannot define the rule of law with reference to other vague concepts. Um, that are also contained in Article 2. It doesn't fit. There, there is, um, the, 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 these governments seem to be saying um, it's too messy was what is being done. Uh, so, so you define the rule of law, for instance, with reference to fundamental rights, but these fundamental rights and equality are used separately in Article 2, so you cannot uh, intertwine them. And here the court says, and I perfectly agree with the court. It's also in line with the Venice Commission and other definitions that are given by the, uh, the, of the rule of law. Um, the values contained in Article 2 are not separately available. They are all intertwined and that you refer to other values is perfectly fine. There is no problem with that and it doesn't uh, mean that the definition in itself is uh, dysfunctional. And finally, um, the Hungarian and Polish government said it's not a concept that you can work with. The rule of law is so vague that it is too imprecise and that in itself is an infringement of uh, legal certainty, you could say, of the rule of law itself. Uh, it's an abstract legal notion. Uh, we don't know what is expected of us. And here the court says, well, um, it's not unheard of to use um, general principles or vague open norms, abstract legal norms in um, uh, the legislation. And moreover, um, there is more clarification in the regulation. And the court goes over all of these exception, uh, um, uh, examples that are given in uh, the regulation and the uh, conditions on which measures can be imposed, and it explains these with reference also to its prior case law, etc. So it says these um, concepts can be used to um, uh, uh, apply a strictly legal analysis. I come to my conclusion. So is the uh, decision of uh, the court a surprise? No, it's not surprising as to the um, interpretation and the use of the, the, the concept of the rule of law. Um, but what will be most interesting is, of course, um, the interpretation of uh, what the court means when it says the values of Article 2 are part of the very identity of the European Union and therefore the European Union must be able to enforce it. So the court uses the word thus. I've always been told if the court says thus, you have to be careful because that could be the announcement of a, a, an, uh, an illogical uh, reasoning. Um, so, um, but, and, and my main question for the future will then be what this will mean for the other values that are, um, meant, that are mentioned in Article 2, for which it then would also mean, for instance, democracy is used in Article 2. It is uh, part of the identity of the European Union. Um, thus, the European Union must be able to enforce it. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that will function. So I will leave it here and then leave the floor. Thank you, Professor Klaas, for your intervention. Uh, our second panelist is Julio Baquero Cruz, Professor of uh, AU Constitutional Law here at the Institut d'Etudes uh, Européennes. And the title of his intervention is Constitutional Principles, Constitutional Identity, and the Union's Overlapping Consensus. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I go directly into the subject with three parts. First, uh, some general remarks, then a few uh, takeaways from the judgment, and then a reflection on where do we stand now after the judgment. Uh, so first, on, on this topic, uh, we've been hearing some strange views. I, I, I will not mention the sinners, only the sins, but all these words come from somewhere. Eh? The, first, that the union is not competent beyond Article 70 U for, for values and the rule of law. Second, that this is a notion that each state declines in the way it wants. Third, that the treaties are ambiguous and recent developments could not be foreseen before the enlargement. And finally, and this is a, 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 an important person who said, that this may justify the position of some of these states and may be shared by other states. 
Uh, I think all of this is groundless because the rule of law has been part of the essence of integration since the founding treaties. It's clear in the creation of the court with the treaties of Paris and, 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 and Rome, with the introduction of the preliminary rulings procedure, with the Copenhagen declaration, the early case law from the 60s. So there's nothing surprising about these developments. And it should remain its basics. There is no integration without the rule of law in the union level and in the member states. Um, but integration today seems to have become orphan, I think. There are not many who defend its raison d'etre today. It only seems to have a stepfathers and a stepmothers, as in children's fable. They are always nasty with the kids, eh? the stepmothers and the stepfathers. <clears throat> by, by integration, I mean the community method based on the central role of the commission in the system, majority decision-making, primacy, and direct effect. Um, what is the essence of this method is to accept to be bound by the decisions with which you don't agree and to accept to be bound by the judgments that say what you don't want to hear. This is the essence of integration. Um, uh, and this is what distinguishes it from the anarchical and dangerous world of the balance of powers under international law, which is what we see today uh, very near the borders of the Union. Well, all this conception of integration, I think, is in deep crisis today. The states <clears throat> don't want to be bound against their will. Majoritarian decision-making is contested, not seen as legitimate in many cases. Some states and some state courts are uncomfortable with primacy and rebel against it, increasingly more so. And, and I think that integration cannot subsist unless the actors that have it and work with it see it as something worth preserving. Um, so I think it's not the union that has put its nose where it should not, it's some member states that have deviated eh, eh, from the common values and the conditions of membership. And it's normal that the union reacts. <coughs> Second reflection on the cases. Um, I think they were brought to gain time, mainly. Uh, um, maybe the applicant states also thought, well, maybe the court will say yes, but, and give us something, and restrict the application of the regulation in some ways. Uh, time, I think they have gained. This is clear. I think it's also unfortunate. On substance, they were uh, hoist by their own petard, if you allow me to quote Prince Hamlet. Or uh, in a less highbrow reference, they were like the coyote in the in the cartoon. He, he prepares a bomb, the road runner passes very quickly, and then it does not set off, and then the coyote goes and see what happens, and it explodes in its face. Eh? It's a bit like that. You, you, I think you mentioned that uh, uh, in, in passing. <clears throat> the impression is that going to the court, these two member uh, states, with a very drastic intergovernmental view of the union, and with a divergent position about what it means to be a member state, they elicit a strong reaction in the opposite sense. And I think the main thing about these judgments is that while they left the regulation intact, the court enriched its jurisprudence on values. Um, <clears throat> the first important general point from the, from the judgments is that the court says that the union has its own identity based on the values of Article 2, and that the union and the institutions must be able to defend those values. I, I will say later what I think this means, which are not just programmatic, but binding, eh? maybe binding. Rule of law is binding, the others we need to see. Um, and that respect for the values is a condition for the enjoyment of all the rights that come with the treaties. This is very clearly said. I think the, uh, and you will remember from the hearing, a public hearing, uh, Judge Safian, the Polish judge, yeah. saying very strongly, the union has its own constitutional identity. What are you telling me about the uh, identity of your constitution? The union has its own constitutional identity, and this went into the judgment. Well, I, I at the time was a question, not an... Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, but uh, it, it seemed a rhetorical question. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and I think it's important to remark that this identity is not an aggressive constitutional identity as with some constitutional courts. It's based on commonality, on what binds us together. It's not particular, it's, it's common. The second important point, I think the court states very clearly, there is a clear relationship between the budget and the rule of law. It's not 
something that has been invented. There is a relationship because if the law is not uh, uh, respected, we cannot be sure that the money will be spent in line with the conditions that EU law itself uh, creates. And the court says, I quote, compliance with those conditions and objectives cannot be fully guaranteed in the absence of effective judicial review by independent courts. I think the message is that among the different rule of law principles, because the rule of law value is a, 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 a composed of several principles which are more, more technical and more precise, <clears throat> the main one is effective judicial protection by independent courts. Without this one element, you cannot have a functioning and acceptable rule of law. Uh, the third point on which I think Emanuele would say more is that the protection of values cannot be confined to the intergovernmental procedure of Article 70 EU. They can and should be protected in the frame, framework <coughs> of all union policies. Uh, this is the court say, says very clearly. Um, the, the applicant states, I think they wanted to disconnect Article 2 from the rest of the treaties and of the legal order and create a, a sort of exclusive binary connection with Article 7. And the court says, no, uh, uh, this is not the case. Uh, below the leaves and the branches and the trunk are the roots of the legal order. And they are essential to give life to the tree of law. In the roots are, of course, the principles and values that give consistency and meaning to the law and put it together. Um, the fourth point, I, I think Monica mentioned already, even though there are differences in the way member states organize their systems, the obligations stemming from values and in particular from the, the rule of law cannot vary from one member state to another. And they have to be assessed in accordance with uniform criteria. This is the court says very clearly. And finally, the European Council is also put in its place because the court says this recital 26, the emergency break, you know, the emergency, the, I don't have to explain. It says, well, it's not law, it's not binding, it's just a recital, and it cannot be relied on as a ground for derogating from the actual provisions of the regulation or for interpreting those provisions in a, mar in a manner that is contrary to their wording. So the emergency break is neutralized in terms of law, eh? in terms of practice, we don't know. And the, I think there is a risk there that we have a deviant practice that is not in line with the law, but nobody attacks because it's the European Council that has said so. So where do we stand? My first reflection is that the court is carrying too much weight in this and that the rule of law will not be able, will not, will not be effectively protected if the political institutions do not do their part. And hence my reading of this, the union must be able to defend its values. It's it, what the court means is all the institutions have to act, not just the court. This is the way I read that, that statement. Um, of course, the equation is complex and there is another variant is that the rule of law crisis has evolved hand in hand with a crisis of the a mutation of the institutional model of the union that in this decade has departed from the majoritarian decision making uh, into intergovernmental methods. And this has uh, evolved hand in hand. Now, it's very difficult, I think, to defend the rule of law as a value through intergovernmental and peer review methods. It, it, it will not happen. Huh? So I think this crisis, because of these, it is not a salutary crisis. It's unlike other crises that can have you know, a reaction. This is a crisis that goes to the heart of the system of integration. Another point I have is, I think it's illusory to think that this is a problem of just <coughs> two member states. It may, it, there are problems in other member states, and actually I would say more. Any member state could have these problems in the light of the unstable political situation. So we should see the treaties and the regulation as a sort of self-binding. Eh? It's the Ulysses metaphor. You bind yourself uh, in order to avoid future problems. Uh, this is constitutionalism, eh? and this is visible in the judgments as well in the passages on uh, uh, non, non, what is left of non-regression. Eh? Uh, I think the conflict is not over at all with the judgments. 
There are signs that the applicant states do not respect, do not recognize the judgments and the authority of the court in public declarations. I think the litigation was not really healthy or really genuine because the main fun function of litigation is once the court has spoken, this is the end of conflict. We agree. This is maybe we don't like it, but this is what it is. And uh, we don't see it here. This has not been achieved. Why? So the, the litigation, I see it more as a symptom than as a remedy. A symptom of, of what? Uh, I think of the erosion of the Rorschach overlapping consensus on which integration used to be based and must be based. Because a political community, even a composite one like the Union, cannot subsist if the very rules of the game are contested on a daily basis and on the basis of unreasonable demands, of unreasonable views. This is not sustainable. But again, the question of the rule of law for us politically is enmeshed with the ongoing tendency to mutate the union into an intergovernmental organization, an organization not of integration, but of cooperation, not one that limits the sovereignties of the member state, but one, one that le leaves the sovereignties intact, untouched. This is the conundrum we have, a sort of contradiction between the rhetoric of defending the values, but how? How can you defend the values effectively through intergovernmental methods? So I think the union's future is at stake in this very issue. And it's not unconnected with the war and with the, what has happened in, 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 in Russia and in Ukraine. Uh, um, and I think in the dialectics, this is traditional dialectics between deepening and widening, we may need to think again what is the right point of equilibrium? Um, we, may, we may not be there. If we put, and you remember Brexit, if you put too much emphasis on unity and you are ready to sacrifice the depth of integration in order to remain together, well, in the end, the risk is that you remain together, but that you remain to, together in something that is, this is hollow, hollow, empty. Eh? This is the risk. Um, and this is a sort of abyss. We remain together, but there is nothing of substance in our togetherness. On the other hand, it is unclear how many states are really committed today to a genuine model of integration. I don't see many of them very enthusiastic about it, not even uh, 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 the ones that you may think about, and how deeply committed they are. And I, 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 I stop there because I don't want to make any prediction. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julio. Our third panelist is Emanuele Rebasti, who is member of the uh, legal service of the Council. And the title of your intervention is Article 7 and Beyond towards a theory of fundamental values, conditionalities. So you have the floor for also 10, 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let me start with a usual disclaimer, especially because I will be speaking about prospective evolution. So uh, I don't want to engage in anyhow the, the, the council and the willingness of the legislator to go into this direction. But what I want to uh, do with, uh, with you today, I said with you today, is uh, um, where, uh, which are the openings that this judgment is doing uh, when it comes to the possible use of uh, conditionality as a technique uh, for supporting the respect, uh, not just of rule of law, as I've been correctly said, but all the values that we have in Article 2. And uh, so um, I think the starting point should be that, yes, the relationship between this conditionality and Article 7 has been uh, at the very basis of the debate uh, already, the legislative debate, uh, that was one of the concerns assessed during the discussion, and uh, naturally has become one of the plea uh, that uh, the two applicants uh, has put forward to contest the legality of the regulation. And here the, the court has solved it uh, in a straightforward way, applying to Article 7, a case law that was developed in relation to infringement proceeding, the Entesche uh, case law. But what is interesting is that the court could have stopped it there and settled like this the matter, but uh, thanks to the, uh, let's say, constitutional opening that have already been stressed uh, 
by the previous speaker, um, actually the court is, uh, is uh, laying the grounds for something more to come, uh, or at least is opening the door to the legislature for the possibility of something more. And, and on this, I, I align totally to what uh, Julio is saying. The court is clearly saying between the line and sometimes uh, not between the line, <laughs> That is up to the legislator to live up to their own responsibility, and that the court cannot be left stand alone in front of the uh, threats that come to the very identity of the European. So, which are these uh, uh, building blocks? Which are these elements that are lying ground for a, I call it a theory of uh, uh, fundamental values conditionality? Well, the elements has been already recalled, but let's put it now uh, in context. Uh, the first one is uh, the court now giving us a, a clear uh, a clarification of the normative status and the normative values of the principle in Article 2. Uh, so uh, clearly, I would say disenfranchising the, value, the Article 2 uh, values. Uh, and why I'm saying disenfranchising? Because you may well be aware of the legal, uh, of the academic debate about can, how can legal two values be operationalized? Do we need another treaty, an article treaty? Is via Article 19, for instance, that we can rely on those values? And the same kind of debate, even if at the time in the academic writing was more about using infringement proceeding, we had it when drafting the legislation and saying, can we only base our conditionality, I mean, not our, but the conditionality regulation on Article 2, or we need to find some other grounds in the treaties. And actually, as part of our defense to the courts, we had prepared a possible uh, article to rely on. That was 317, that is about the competence implementing the, the budget and the responsibility of the member states in implementing the budget. So. Here, the judgment is interesting for what he has not said, because the judgment could have just took 317, uh, how we were suggesting in a conservative way, let's say, and based on the reasoning out of there without doing all this constitutional reasoning on Article 2. So on the contrary, the court decided, let's uh, stop it. Let's stop it with the specific sectorial uh, legal basis we have in the treaty. And let's go to the core. Article 2 as a normative value, as its own, is setting uh, uh, obligation of result the member states have to respect, and not just at the beginning, but during all their membership, because these are the very uh, fundamental condition for the enjoyment of the rights under, under the regulation. The second element uh, uh, in the negative, because it's not written in the judgment, but I think it's linked to the value, normative values article 2, is that the court is here doing a balancing on treaty-based values, huh? because we do have article 2, but we have also mutual trust all across the uh, disposal. And here the court is telling us, well, mutual trust is not this sucker deal. Uh, mutual trust, if something is going wrong uh, with the respect of uh, fundamental values, can be put in question. Mm -hmm. Because that's what is doing uh, the conditionality regulation. We are assuming mutual trust can no longer be implied, but uh, we need still to intervene to protect the budget. And this is, I think, a crucial element if you are thinking in, in the perspective use of uh, well, these values as the base for other conditionalities. The second important element that also you stress is the empowerment of the EU institution. The call very strong that comes from the court, and I will not develop this here, but indeed there is a duty for the institution to act and to protect within uh, the competence of the union. The competence, not the legal basis, which is an interesting other element for a construction of the legal framework on conditionality. And finally, the third element is this institutional balance and relationship with Article 7, where uh, the position of Article 7 is totally really re-qualified re, uh, and put it like somehow in a corner. So uh, the perspective is open at the Council we had as Article 7 is the main door for uh, the uh, <laughs> respect, for promoting the respect and enforcement of fundamental values and rule of law, actually is totally sidelined for the opportunity that this judgment is opening. So here uh, I should enter the second part of my speech. That these are, so if these are the, the, the grounds, the elements that the court is putting in front of us, the instrument that is giving us, 
where can we go from here on? So does it exist a theory of, uh, uh, of legal uh, fundamental values conditionality? What are the legal boundaries for the use of these new instruments? I have no time to go through all the reflections here, but let's say that uh, we still have, I mean, the, the court by deciding this specific case is also giving us another important element when the legislator will start reflecting on possible other form of conditionalities. And one element uh, is for sure the very important uh, requirements of having a clear link between the policy objective that is pursued by the, the uh, uh, the legislator, uh, uh, by the competence that is exercised, and uh, uh, the conditionality that is put in place. And this has to be reflected both in terms of uh, the aim pursued, but also in terms of the design that the conditionality needs to have. And I have to say, it's a bit of satisfaction for, for a lawyer of the council that can be criticized in many other respects. <laughs> but, uh, the court is relying very much on a number of uh, changes that uh, took place. And I think if someone was there at the debate we had years ago about this, and that was exactly the debate. So uh, is this uh, about fundamental values or is this about budget? The court has said this is about budget. And therefore, all the different uh, features of the conditionality need to be uh, designed in light of this. So for instance, when we defined the conditions, it was of paramount importance that uh, we establish in such a clear way the need for a sufficiently uh, close link between uh, uh, the impact on the budget and the breach of the rule of law. For the court, this was paramount to say this is not about sanctioning a breach, but this is about reacting to a threat to the budget. In terms of proportionality, it's the same. The court stresses the proportionality is about is related to the impact on the budget, not to the breach as such of the rule of law, uh, the type of measures, and also the condition for the lifting of the measures. The court, and this is important, and now the commission has taken it in its guidelines, says, well, if the impact on the budget comes to an end, if there is no uh, risk uh, for the policy area, if we think to another, uh, I mean, to a broader uh, horizon, uh, a future application in other domain, then the simple fact that uh, it perdures a breach of a fundamental value becomes no longer relevant because here it is uh, about uh, protecting the budget or uh, the aim pursued by another policy dimension. We have also elements about governments that I think are interesting here in, in the reflection about the future use of, of this technique. Uh, so far we have seen uh, council in the front line. Um, can we envisage, of course, commission in the front line, but why not even decentralized implementation by the national judges would be in the front line of this uh, implementation? And when I'm telling this, I'm thinking to possible practical application of conditionalities. Where? where which are the domains where this could come up? Well, uh, if you think of the case law we have, I think, for instance, a natural, uh, natural uh, breeding ground for this could be uh, justice in home affairs could be uh, the domain of European arrest warrant, where we already have a jurisprudential construction, a case law construction on the possibility to sustain the application exceptionally of an European arrest warrant and be beyond the cases uh, where uh, there has been a triggering of Article 7. So uh, I think that it would not be uh, impossible to think uh, of conditionality uh, here in terms, in legislative terms, that, that links uh, uh, this perduring mutual trust with respect of what? Maybe rule of law for sure, but also fundamental rights, why not, of the people that will uh, end up uh, uh, adding those fundamental rights at least if uh, uh, surrendered according to the European Arrest Law. There are many other things we could say, but here, let me, uh, why not, I mean, if you want to be provocative, I know that uh, Professor Alemano uh, is following us. Uh, another potential domain where maybe we, we could uh, think about is electoral law. Huh? Uh, could not we envisage, in case of breaches of democratic principle, Article 2, uh, could not uh, uh, envisage mechanism of conditionality when it comes uh, to the electoral law or the election of the members of the European Parliament? <laughs> Uh, but 
this is just food for thoughts. Uh, I would just want to conclude by yeah, saying yes, this is a very interesting potential development, but let's see also what are the risks of this uh, approach, or at least let's think a bit to the broader picture. Huh? Uh, uh, this is not going to be uh, the, the, the ultimate solution of the rule of law uh, issues that we have, or in general, values crisis that we have in Europe. To start with, we have to be realistic. I was already pleading for realism back then, uh, and I keep on pleading for realism about the use of conditionalities, exactly because there are linear and limits linked to this legal technique, and they are the limit that the court has stressed, and uh, that, are, that is fundamentally the nexus that we still need to have between the, the promotion of the values uh, of the rule of law and uh, the policy area where this takes place. Uh, this can lead in certain cases to have, uh, um, let's say, ex ex exaggerated expectation to what you can achieve via a conditionality mechanism, as it, uh, it can apply to also for this rule of law conditionality, budgetary conditionality mechanism. And uh, um, another issue, but maybe I leave it uh, uh, for the debate, is the one of danger of fragmentation of the notion of values or rule of laws. Uh, is there a danger, uh, given the opening that the court has now done? Because I, I, where I don't agree with uh, Professor Class is we don't have a definition in the regulation. We have a non-definition, because when we were uh, legislating uh, the regulation, we did all the possible to just codify what the court has already said. Huh? So there was clearly an attention, and this was done to reduce uh, the, 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 legal, the political uh, difficulties in the negotiations, to try to stick as much as possible to what was already clear out there in the jurisprudence in order not to open another front on the definition of this rule of law. But this was uh, what happened in this case, uh, but could not envisage also a different dynamics where a legislative text is used to in, uh, supplement, uh, modify, introduce element that could be more controversial as to the notion of this or that value. And finally, the final final issue that really would like to discuss with you is, is this a mechanism effective? Um, in the sense, can a value crisis can be resolved in a, with a confrontational approach? With, a me with mechanism that leads out with the adoption of measures. They are not sanctioned or <laughs> clarified, but these are, uh, uh, in any event, suspension of rights ensuing from the treaties or from the uh, secondary legislation. Because, I mean, it, it can be an often in academia, and if I have a criticism uh, about many academic writing on this, is exactly this, no? It is, this rule of law was a, uh, the holy grail to, to solve the problem because finally we have an instrument that can be triggered by a qualified majority and we can apply measure to everyone. Yes, but then we also have a pending constitutional case in front of the Polish Constitutional Court where the same kind of issue that has been debated by the German Constitutional Court in relation to the quantitative easing of the, of the European Central Bank is at, is at end. Basically, the question posed to the Constitutional Court of Poland is, is the treaty compatible with the uh, Polish Constitution as far as allows the establishment of a rule of law conditionality that uh, uh, impinges on the constitutional identity of Poland? And if the court says, uh, Yes, it is inconstitutional. Then what is next? Uh, what is next? We don't have an European army that can enforce uh, manu militari. This. So the whole European construction remains and still is based on the uh, consensus, uh, the sense, the acceptance of the member of the club to abide by the rule of the club. And when this uh, acceptance comes to an end, then what are the alternatives? Well, I know these are bigger problems than the debate today, and I think I've already talked too much. So, no, no, I need to give you. the floor. Thank the you, thank you. Our last panelist is online. I hope that you can hear us. It's Rene Ripazzi, professor of law at Erasmus University of Rotterdam and member of the European Parliament. The title is The Implication of the Judgments of the Union's Budget and Its Law. 
Do you hear us? Yes? Excellent. Yes, I can hear you. Do you have the floor for 10, 12 minutes? Thank you. Okay. And you can properly also hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, because the weird thing is now, since I'm looking on the screen, I can see myself, but with a certain delay that makes me. <laughs> uh, yeah, still in the second year of the pandemic, using these tools, uh, I still find them somewhat confusing. Now, um, thanks a lot for having invited me to speak here. And uh, to be very honest, I rather put now on my hat of my previous and also still current position as law professor uh, at Erasmus University Rotterdam, uh, despite the fact that since the beginning of February, I'm also a member of the European Parliament. I have kept my position as law professor at Erasmus University Rotterdam. And in this uh, particular setting, I also prefer to uh, talk academically than politically on the matter. Um, and uh, the title, the title of, of the presentation that I, that I would like to give is that the implications of the judgments on the union's budget and its law. Now, having heard the previous speaker, I could basically stop here and say, let's start the debate. <laughs> because the previous speaker was addressing a lot of issues that are actually linked indeed on the implications of the judgment on the union budget. Um, so I think it is necessary to stress that the uh, regulation that these two judgments were about is one tool amongst many others when it comes to um, ensuring that uh, the financial means of the, of the European Union are used properly. And I think it should also be mentioned that conditionality is uh, nothing new under the sun. Um, I, my own field of specialization is actually the law of economic and monetary union. And in, uh, in this field of specialization, we are dealing with a budget conditionality already since 2013, when the conditionality for uh, country-specific recommendations was introduced in the um, structural funds uh, regulation. Already back then, somewhat debated as to the legality of that. And the argument there was made, now, yeah, well, if you are paying European money to member states, then there has to be sound, uh, sound management of, um, the, 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 of the budgets in those member states. Hence, there is a link to country-specific recommendations in the field of economic governance, because their purpose is to ensure sound <coughs> budgets in those particular member states. Now, that link, to be very honest, uh, seems to be um, even more remote than the one that we have in the rule of law conditionality that we are looking at. But so that means we have introduced this mechanism of conditionality already earlier. Um, and back then, in, these, in those debates, we have introduced this conditionality because we lacked of any creativity and legally meaningful ways to give those country-specific recommendations more teeth because we have figured that member states ultimately don't care, and they start caring when, once they need financial assistance from the ESM. But that's basically the moment when it's too late. So there has to be somewhat to be done before we are that far. And the only idea that came up and was legally feasible under the treaties was creating conditionality. And um, having had then a look at the first drafts on the rule of law conditionality, it reminded me a lot of uh, the debates that there were um, on, in economic governance and linking economic governance to the cohesion funds, the structural funds. Now, here we have already one thing, and that also already shows the, the link that, was, that, we, that we already had. Country-specific recommendations and the proper use of the financial means of the union. Uh, and if we go now into the details and look into the country-specific recommendations for Poland and Hungary, then the rule of law issues were already mentioned in those country-specific recommendations, because obviously rule of law shortcomings have implications on um, the soundness of, of, uh, of national budgets. Hence also the link that was drawn to not yet pay out the uh, financial means from the recovery uh, funds and next generation EU. The link was made to the country-specific recommendations. And that link was actually already available since 2013 when it comes to structural funds. So already here, 
Commission could have uh, frozen a, a certain financial means from structural funds on the basis of country-specific recommendations and the conditionality in that particular regulation. So that shows we have already a couple of tools available. Uh, nevertheless, we got this rule of work conditionality and from a law uh, professor's perspective, I welcome it actually very much because now the conditionality is located where it belongs to as a budgetary tool on the basis of a budgetary legal basis and with a clear connection to uh, the financial interests of the union. That also makes it clear and Therefore, I must stress again, I'm talking here in my law professor's function, that um, we cannot go beyond the understanding of a budgetary defense tool. This is what it is. This is what the legal base allows. I recall the debates in Parliament that was, of course, requesting much more. And I have sympathy from a political point of view for these calls. But here we are entering the same kind of gray zone that we already entered in economic and monetary union. And if we want to make it, to link it to the union budget on the basis of this particular legal base, then it is only a budgetary defense tool. And this is what the European Court of Justice has very clearly confirmed in the judgments. This is a budgetary defense tool and it has, it has, it has to be strictly necessary for protecting the financial interests of the union. Nevertheless, I do believe that this judgment has some interesting opening, uh, some interesting openings. First of all, um, I think that the paragraph that, uh, I found the most interesting one is the one in paragraph 129, the Hungarian judgment, in which the court notes that the union budget is one of the principal instruments for giving practical effect to the principle of solidarity mentioned in Article 2. I think it was already previously mentioned that there is this line of reasoning that the union is built on the idea of mutual trust, which entails that there's a common understanding of the rule of law and which requires kind of trust that those values are respected in a comparable manner in all member states. It basically paved also the way towards the constitutional identity uh, argument. And then linking this clearly to the union budget being the principal instrument um, to give practical effect to it uh, shows that even though we have a very close link between rule of law conditionality and the, and the union budget, the union budget is getting a broader purpose. And by that opening an interesting debate, whether there might not be some more areas in which a rule of law conditionality could be extended. And I read now this together with the, with the paragraph 229, one of the paragraphs later in the Hungarian judgment, in which the court makes this interesting connection between the values in Article 2 and bringing them together. At the very end of this paragraph, the court states, although Article 2 TEU refers separately to rule of law as a value common to the member states and to the principle of non-discrimination, it is clear that a member state whose society is characterized by discrimination cannot be regarded as ensuring respect for the rule of law within the meaning of that common value. And by that, basically also giving a broader scope to the rule of law as in many of the previous case laws. Now, linking 229 to, 120, to 129 shows that a broader understanding of rule of law is possible. Yet, the rule of law conditionality regulation does also not prevent the European Commission later and the Council to make it broader in their very application, since the wording of the regulation is open enough to go there. Nevertheless, and that is the end, the court gave the message, I see a broader understanding of rule of law as a concept. I see a clear linking between budget and the rule of law. But, and then at the end, it narrowed it down. You have to be really looking at uh, a very strict connection between uh, what is happening on the ground and which implications that has for the union budget. Um, so in that sense, on an abstract level, it is very much to welcome what the court said. Also, from a budgetary perspective, when you look at, at, the, at the actual uh, outcomes, 
it has confirmed the very narrow understanding of rule of law conditional anti regulation being, as said initially, a budgetary defense instrument. And um, that brings me then what implications that has for the union budget itself. I believe it is also a good reminder to the union uh, budgetary legislator, so both council and parliament, the union budget is the principal instrument to achieve the objectives and the common values of the union. Hence also looking in the design of the union budget to uh, find this one back. Second, I do believe that there is more potential, and I think um, uh, the previous speaker has made a reference to this, to extend the instrument of conditionality in other fields that are core to the union policies. I do not believe that the rule of law conditionality legal basis would be the right one for this, but I do believe that uh, the 177, so everything what is linked to cohesion funds, where we currently have the conditionality for country-specific recommendations is something to look closer into, in particular because the court made this connection between union budget and the rule of law. Let me conclude on um, a final thought, which is honestly something that keeps bothering me since 2013, since the conditionality with the country-specific recommendations was introduced into um, the structural funds regulation. And that is that the whole point of the financial means that we pay out, which is either agriculture for France or cohesion funds for the Central and Eastern European member states. Uh, if you look at the cohesion funds, the whole point is that there is some sort of redistribution between member states because of the structural shortcomings vis-a-vis -vis powerful market players like Germany, Italy, or France, which is already limited looking at 1% of GDP and only the share of it that goes to those countries. Is it really achieving the purpose, realizing the purpose of the cohesion funds if we overburden it with conditionalities? So uh, given that the whole point of this country is to elevate a country's economy and by that citizens in this country at a higher level so that they are able within the internal market to keep up with the tough competition that we do have there. So in a sense, we actually use conditionality as a fig leaf because there are no other proper means that hurt those countries. Yet the point of cohesion funds is a total different one and don't be punished the wrong ones. I personally believe this is the case. But this brings us to the main shortcoming of how we have designed cohesion funds, namely that they go via the governments to the citizens. And by that, they will be re-bottled by governments in this is what we do. So therefore, um, continue citizens supporting us what we are doing. Hence, if we put it in a broader reflection on what is how union budgets should evolve in my, in my point of view is, that we should rather uh, strengthen direct payments from the European Union to civil society organizations, to those that actually have a right to that money and bypassing governments that can then rebottle European Union money so that the effect that we want to achieve with those, namely cohesion and increasing um, uh, member state societies coming closer without financing autocratic regimes that misuse or even abuse union funding. Now, having said this very general point, um, I then uh, hereby conclude with my thoughts on the implications of the judgments on the union budget, and I'm curious about the discussion that we are now going to have. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Uh, let's move on to the second time of this panel, so you have the opportunity, it's not mandatory, of course, to react if you want to the different presentation, and maybe... Should I, should I begin? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to insist, so I'm not going to take too much time other than um, seconding what uh, René Repassi has uh, just said. And this, I think, is not the strongest part of the court, where it refers to solidarity. Um, because I, I completely agree with what René just said about uh, the point of the funds and the redistribution, etc. The, 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 the concept of solidarity is, is used in the judgments in a, very, in a rather thin way. 
it's approached as um, you get the money if you behave, if you misbehave, you don't get the money. This is, um, whereas it doesn't, it doesn't say anything about the other ways of redistribution solidarity that exist in the European Union that should exist in the European Union. So I, I share the, the the uncomfortable feeling that the reading of the judgment on this part. Um, uh, leaves, and I think that this is also in, in, indeed something that we need to, um, to to study more and to think about more, because this version of solidarity is rather thin and not one that th this should be based on. For the rest, I think that I, I um, have enjoyed the, 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 the talks of the, of, of the other speakers, and I would rather leave the floor to them with their inside knowledge. I, I forgot to give my disclaimer, and of course I'm also. <laughs> and I want, since, since this is recorded, I want to say that I, I'm speaking here on a purely personal okay. and academic capacity, yeah. and not for the commission. So, uh, but the time was very short, and I, I was rushing. I have a. But I some, only mention new academic titles. Yes, this is why you you, you, so let, you let me into confusion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, no, some points, uh, and I want to, to hear you out on this. I mean, there is this very technical legal issue of the enforceability and cognizable, judicial cognizability of Article 2. Yeah? Mm. Um, I think it's a non issue eh? because since these are values, they have to, and they are reflected in other more precise provisions. But, but this is lawyers, we like these things. And, and it seems now that at least the value of the rule of law itself is an obligation uh, obligation de resultat, an obligation as to the result to be achieved. And this may be also the case with some of the other values. Uh, it's also clear that the second sentence also includes values, and this was not clear before. Um, and so this is, I think, interesting. And I want to, uh, uh, and I, I think the court does not resolve all these problems only for the rule of law. But we need to work by analogy and see what we can do with the other values. But I, rem I remain convinced that their main use is to be used as aid for the interpretation of more specific provisions in the treaties and in legislation. Um, another uh, uh, point I have is I think the Article 2A is a definition, and there. I, I'm more with you than, than with my uh, uh, dear friend Emanuele. Uh, I think it's a definition. It actually comes from the rule of law framework, yeah. almost verbatim. Yeah. And now it becomes positive law. Uh, and it's a thick definition. It's a substantive definition. And it includes also non-discrimination. And the court has said non-discrimination is part of the rule of law. Fundamental rights only in so far as effective judicial protection is linked to them. Yeah, but non-discrimination is in itself part of the rule of law. So I think this is important. For the first time, we have a more precise definition of the rule of law in legislation. Um, the other point I have is, 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 is for Emanuele. I don't think this is a confrontational instrument, because if you look at Article 6, it's a dialogical procedure. It's very long. There are many exchanges, and the member state concerned can present remedies at any time. The idea is not to go and impose measures. The idea is to resolve the problems for the union budget. Um, so I think uh, and the non-confrontational, I, I don't think it's confrontational, but the other methods so far have proved completely useless. Uh, 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 they have achieved. Nothing. So uh, I think if you persist on, on a way that has not produced anything for the reasons I, I tried to explain, well, it's not, not very intelligent, let's say. <laughs> um, so not, it's not confrontational. Eh? It's a dialogue, and I think we need to see it as part of the landscape and use it. It's an administrative procedure. Eh? It's an administrative procedure for the protection of the budget. And of course, it's linked to the protection of the budget, and this is a comment uh, uh, for uh, uh, Professor Repassi. A strict connection, yes, but um, it, the court says genuine link. Eh? Genuine link. 
And we tend to see this, at least I tend to see this as excluding hypothetical connections, vague and certain connections. But the connection doesn't need to be causal to a particular a, a project, or it, it can also be an inference, especially when it comes to risks, because the court makes very clear in both judgments that this instrument has a, a, a very important preventive dimension. It's not only reactive or corrective. The, the court says, you need to prevent this from happening. No? Um, and there, I think the court, for the risk, what it requires is that you have a high probability that the breach will lead to an impact on the budget. And this, I think, uh, what the court means is you need to carry out a sort of a statistical analysis. High probability is a language, the language of statistics. So the connection has to be there, but uh, I don't think it's so, so strict as to render the instrument uh, uh, too rigid, yeah? And I stop there. Yeah, so, uh, no, thank you for the inputs, and uh, I think there are very interesting elements, and the reflection should continue. Huh? Um, but, um, well, I have an issue on what you have said about uh, the notion of solidarity here being so weak. I don't think so. Um, I think, on the contrary, that uh, the court clarifies and uh, is in line with uh, other cases, though, in other domains, um, that solidarity, of which, I mean, the, the, the budget is the most clear manifestation, cannot go uh, without having a mutual trust and a degree of responsibility. That is the assumption that the other will ab abide by the rules, will use the money they receive in order to pursue the objective for which they are meant. So this is the essence of the, the link between conditionality, I mean, uh, solidarity and responsibility. There cannot be a blind, a blind and this it is what the, 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 the Court of Justice has also the, uh, said, that does not exist a blind mutual trust. So it does not exist a blind responsibility, because after all, these monies are the monies of the taxpayers in the various member states that have made the choice of considering that the welfare of other member states is good for them as well, but provided that they, they, they comply with the rules. So I think uh, uh, this is one of the candy that we put uh, 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 in front of the court. Now, you know, as a lawyer, when you go there and you have this uh, very, very, uh, yeah, fundamental issues, you try to provide key of readings or of, uh, yeah, uh, you try to give the court hints of uh, how uh, it could be solved, and I think we were squarely, squarely in this line of reasoning. Um, another uh, candidate, on the contrary, the court has not taken, and that we were proposing to the court, it concerns about, uh, coming back again, to the normative value of Article of Article Two, because uh, uh, what we were arguing in a conservative way, of course, because you you try to to avoid uh, taking too far-fetched position, no? or, or maybe you should sometimes. No? <laughs> but in a conservative way, we were saying, well, listen, these values permeate all the uh, provision of the treaties, all the the uh, policies of the treaties. Huh? So actually. Uh, you can use them via the, the, the various competences. And the court here was much more strong and much, uh, much more blunt in saying, we don't care. We, we do have actually instrument specific ones. I mean, it's very interesting a passage of, of the judgment where it is when they discuss Article 7 saying, the treaty is already plenty of other instruments that allow to defend the rule of law. It is in the treaties, in the charter, it is in secondary legislation. But actually, you don't need anything of ours because it is already in Article 2. And I think that this is a big opening. I mean, it's not new, it's not surprising, but it is a, a formalization of a case law that was in the making that actually has been in the making this year while we were, we were discussing the, the piece of legislation. So uh, concerning this, remember that when we started the discussion, many of these case law concerning the judges was not there yet. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was really a case law in the making, which it shows that there has been a dialogue in between the legislator and the court already during the, the doing of the, of the legislative text. And I, I also want to, to, to react to uh, something that Professor Rapazia said uh, about cohesion policy. Indeed, uh, this is a very, very uh, uh, natural application of conditionality, actually. 
there is a lot of conditionality already in the new in the new uh, cohesion funds in the new CPR common provision regulation that is uh, this regulation that governs this lay down the general rules for the implementation of the funds we still have macroeconomic conditionality which allows via uh, uh, the semester also the relevance of, of, of certain rule of law issues, but we also have stronger uh, and clearer horizontal, they call it now enabling conditions that are ex ante. Is the charter enabling yes, conditions? That's, that's about the, the values. That's about the the value. charter enabling conditions. But what's the difference if compared to what we have here? Well, it is still a focus that yes. in there is much very, is very much linked to the specific application of the funds in question, because when you take uh, the better horizontal enabling condition, you will see, yeah, the reference is, member says that to be in place arrangement to ensure compliance of the programs supported by the fund with the charter. So uh, what we have in the rule of law conditionality, and it is fundamentally different from this, is it is much uh, horizontal, is broader, is higher if you want does not have to concern, does need to have an impact on, but not, does not necessarily have to concern the specific program. When I was pleading, or not pleading, <laughs> let me remind myself my disclaimer, <laughs> but when I was arguing whether this uh, uh, judgment opened the way to new form of conditionality, I was thinking uh, to conditionality beyond the domain of the budget, <coughs> where I totally agree conditionality is already a mainstream tool. And I'm considering other policies that have nothing to do with the budget. But after all, it's something that really has nothing to do with the rule of law as the budget uh, can be relevant for the, the implementation of the values. Why not other domains of EU policies that are so much closer to the respect of the values? And Justice and Home Affairs, I think, is a, is a good example. If, if I can add something that may be interesting is that not only it's significantly broader, but we had doubts of interpretation of the regulation as to whether it covered revenue. Ah, but yes. <laughs> the, because I think this is important. The, the, yeah. ba the budget is revenue and expenditure. And, the, uh, and we had doubts, and it wasn't clear among, among, among the, in the institutions whether revenue was covered. And the court has said in several places that revenue is covered as well. So the court has clarified, and this was not discussed in the in the hearing or in the pleadings. Eh? And, uh, well, in the pleading we didn't discuss because exactly we had questioning doubts and so yes, you it wasn't exposing, clear. It yeah. wasn't clear, but the court has now said uh, the whole uh, continent of revenue, which is it's, it's a huge continent, yes. is also covered by the regulation. Eh? Yeah. Um, Professor Repassi, do you want to react to or for two minutes? Yeah, just a, a, a quick remark. I also found this mentioning of the revenue particularly interesting, but here also the wording, because the court says income pass is not only revenue made available, but also expenditure. Whilst the, the, the natural thinking would be the other way. Now everybody thinks about expenditure and we have actually to extend it to revenue. The court made the opposite argument, saying, well, what count, what, what is applicable to revenue is also applicable to expenditure. So, indeed, I found that a highly interesting uh, in, in, in the Hungarian judgment. I think I want to make only one remark because I completely concur with what Monica Klaas said on the, uh, on the principle of solidarity. We should honestly not overestimate um, uh, or give too high value to conditionality. This is an instrument invented by the International Monetary uh, Fund and by the World Bank in order to enforce certain policy prerogatives that countries normally don't want to have. And it created a lot of resistance in those countries that had to implement it just because otherwise they would go bankrupt. And uh, we copy pasted it then in the Euro crisis into, into our legal framework. We saw it somewhat works. And so we try to expand it and expand it and expand it. But we should not forget that what it creates among citizens is more a resistance to the policy objectives that are um, put on member state governments and ultimately also national parliaments uh, than that it actually does good to, uh, to, to, to the societies. So in that sense, I would still rather recommend to use conditionality as a targeted tool 
than as a broad tool in the overall toolbox uh, of the union. Uh, thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> no, 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 it's time to uh, open uh, the floor to the question from the public. I, I would suggest to begin maybe with three or four questions from the public who is on site, I would say. So, from the close up, please. So, thank you, Max, uh, the four speakers for, for your wonderful presentation. And I, I have a question for Kuri, but also touches upon the other three speakers, which is about the connection between values, which is really so central in the, in the, in the ruling. And I, I want to take a little bit of David Samuki's position, but David doesn't mean the blanket, it means basically your wider criticism to the mechanism of protecting the law. So, I have two, two issues here. Uh, the first one is. Uh, how much do you think that the, the ruling raises a kind of obligation? It's a very theoretical question, it's not really a practical, right? So you can then result with the question. But the question is how much of an obligation do you think the ruling raises to improve the democratic quality of the European Union itself? Because you are speaking about uh, reinforcing and reaching the value of the Union. Certainly, this cannot be interpreted only of the values of the member states, also the values of the Union, right? So I may read that in the, in the ruling there is an implicit obligation, and of course you can say that I'm inferring a lot out of the reading, but nevertheless, something is very critical attention is that the one criticism that the union needs to improve democratic credentials to be credible, precisely, and enforcing the law. That would be one of the elements. The second one, more precisely, to the concept of constitutional identity that you have a shout for you, but I like it. Um, and here I have a question which I don't really have a opinion about. But the question would be, how much of Islamophism we should expect in terms of Christian identity between the Union and its member states? Basically, the values in Article 2 are interpreted in a very coherent way between member states and the Union if you look at dignity, if you look at human rights, if you look at rule of law. But if you look at democracy, then, and we, are, and we look at all the criticism about democratic deficit, then all kinds of questions appear about the diverging quality of democracy at the European Union level via the member states. So we're speaking of, of course, to, to the dimension of constitutional identity. And my question for you is how the burden those constitutional identities can be to hold the system coherent and consistent. I know that's a very theoretical question that I would like to hear you. Thank you. Well, can we take some more questions? Yes, just give you one or two minutes for interview us. Does it yes, I'm going to try and um, frame this as a question, which is going to be but, um, in relation to solidarity, and I'm looking at paragraph 129 of the Hungarian judgment. I think it's extraordinarily interesting because um, it refers to the case of Commission, sorry, Germany and Poland, which is a case about uh, Article 194 on the energy policy. And um, it concerns either not um, not three one or three two, I don't remember, and it doesn't matter. But Poland was objecting to uh, to a measure that the Commission had taken in favour of Germany in that context. And Germany said actually just the same as Hungary and Poland had done here. Uh, but in relation to solidarity in Article 194, well this is just aspiration. It's not actually legal, it's not binding. And the court said, no, that's not correct. Uh, so that's interesting, I think. Uh, but what is, uh, that was in the context of Article 194, <laughs> concerns uh, energy. And now, in, uh, in paragraph 129 of the Hungarian judgment, the court is now extending this principle of solidarity, making it a binding uh, uh, provision across the board. Across the board. Across the board. And I think that solidarity, and I think uh, if I understood him correctly, Professor uh, Cassin uh, and, and others have said, um, there's a danger in taking solidarity too far. There is a limit to it. And um, I was um, quite uh, taken aback by an article that I read in the uh, Common Law Review, which appeared, I think, in 2020 about solidarity from the internal market in the context of the uh, uh, COVID crisis. And it was written by, 
I'm not going to say his name, he partly was forgotten it, but partly because I think it would be inappropriate. But he, he is a, a, um, a, obviously an EU law scholar, but also uh, an MEP, and I think it's not Professor Akassi. Um, but it was clear that, uh, I mean, I did feel that it was an, an from a, uh, a new member state, and basically it was almost saying, it almost makes this uh, 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 point of saying, uh, because of the spirit of uh, the principle of solidarity, which hardly was mentioned at all in the treaty before Lisbon, but is now all over the treaty, that uh, countless, there are about 10 different mentions of uh, uh, solidarity across, across the, the, the treaty, uh, starting in um, Article 2 TU. And this author was saying, more or less, um, we have to reread Article 36 in the light of yeah. the principle of solidarity. In other words, he was almost saying, imagine he doesn't mention it in the state, but he imagined that Germany um, has to give, even if it hasn't got enough uh, protective clothing, whatever, to save its own citizens, uh, to keep them alive, it must check because of the principle of solidarity. And I think that goes too far. And uh, in that, obviously, it will be politically very problematic. But uh, legally, I think it goes too far because I do think that as it is, the court has interpreted Article 36 very narrowly. And I question whether there's any room to take it any further just because the principle of solidarity has been put all over the treaty uh, since, uh, since the debate. Thank you. It's just an example, of course, of how or what issues can arise in relation to solidarity. So maybe we can pull the question. Yes, oh, yeah. um, Thank you for your speeches. Uh, first, I have just a remark and then a question. Um, so my remark would be, um, you said, uh, it's for Professor Bakero. You said that it's the member states who have dedicated, and uh, so it's not the European Union, that it wouldn't it be because of Article 4, uh, Paragraph 2, object of the European Union law, uh, national constitutional identity, so, if the member states are the problem, if they are the sinners, uh, isn't this the problem? Is it the member states? Or can we actually talk about what legal scholars talk, a constitutional derepresentation of EU law, of, uh, of the European Union, because of actually giving this opportunity through Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty of the European Union? So, this actually leads to the first question. Is there always the relationship between national constitutional identity and the very constitutional identity of the EU, as we saw in the judgments. And then, uh, my, second, my second question addressed to, to, to the panel in general. Um, we heard the panel say that uh, rule of law values can and should be protected by all union institutions. So we saw before, um, before the judgments, we saw that there was a debate, there was a different vision um, uh, regarding the, the finality, the objective of the, of the regulation. So actually, um, if the, talk, the, the court through this judgment talks about the very constitutional identity of, of the EU, of the EU values, how can it reconciliate this dissonance? Um, uh, between these different visions of the three institutions, the European Council, Parliament, and uh, Commission. Was there really uh, a dissonance, or it can be conciliated by the court or by, by a dialogue, as you said? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe a last question. Is this too long? I think it's enough <laughs> for the first round. Um, will you maybe? I can start, but very very quickly and tentatively, because I'm not sure. Okay. Um, first to, to Carlos. I think the, the we, we should not read too much into the judgments. That's the first thing. I, I think the judgments are about the validity of the regulation uh, and the value of the rule of law uh, as a condition for, a, 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 for the management of the union budget. That's the main point of the judgments. Uh, now, it's clear that the court wants to send signals to say, you know, the union and all its institutions have to defend all the values actively throughout the different policies of the union. Now, democracy, of course, is a particular one because it's less technical than the rule of law. It's, it's more, well, you can make it technical in the sense of electoral law and 
uh, uh, circumscriptions and rights. And you can make it more technical, but it's more political, yeah? And I'm not sure whether the court would say that how it would treat democracy. Uh, there is a case law on democracy, but uh, there is no case law on, on, on the value of democracy as such. And I'm not sure how, you, how we would treat it. I think a um, uh, democratic quality of the union can be improved, but I don't think the union is in breach of democracy. Yeah, because the idea in the judgment is you, you can uh, realize the values in different ways. They don't give you an obligation de moyen. De moyen, you are free to choose your means, but you need to respect the result. Now, I cannot, you cannot say, I think, a, a, a correctly in law that the union is breaching the principle of democracy. It has the, democra the democratic life that it has. It may be improved, like the democracy in, in, in member states. And of course, the conditions for democracy at the union level are not the same as the conditions for democracy at the member state uh, uh, at the member state level. So, in that sense, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think this is more or less what I would would answer to your to your question. Solidarity will be for for Monica, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Even though. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's clearly important for the provisions where it is mentioned in migration, Article 1 to 2, and so on and so forth. But now it's a value as well, and you need to read it as much as possible or necessary into other provisions, because otherwise it would lose how far you, how far you go. It depends on the different issues, areas, and so on and so forth. But you need to take it into account in other areas as well, not only where it is specifically mentioned, eh? because uh, uh, this is the nature of general principles. They are uh, nowhere, but everywhere, yeah? And then uh, the questions from, what is your name, sorry? Roila. Roila, okay. I, I, you were very quick. I, I'm not sure I understood uh, all, the, all the questions. I don't think the problem is with Article 4.2 or the legal discourse. I think this is, the problems we have are political. And they uh, they come from the uh, the crisis in in politics, eh? populism, the and the crisis in politics, which is not unconnected to the economic crisis, eh? uh, uh, because uh, we have seen a, a sort of fragmentation of the political parties of, in almost all the member states, eh? maybe may, may even in all the member states. So I don't think it's a link to legal developments. It's, it's, it's political. Um, what is the relationship between national constitutional identities and, the, and that of the union? <clears throat> I think the, the constitutional identity of the union is, is based on the constitutional identities of the member states and what is common. So the area of overlap, which is vast, it, it's actually wider than the area of specificity. Where the space for constitutional, constitutional specificity would be special characteristics of one member state or two member states which are not shared by all of them, but deserve a, a, a respect because they are reasonable in the, in the Rawlsian sense. They are based on reasonable claims about what is a just society. Maybe we don't share them, but we need to respect them, yeah? Uh, and that would be a, 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 my, my, answer, my answer to that. And on, on the views of the different institutions, I would also leave that to you because I, 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 I no, because I, I didn't, I was thinking about the other question and I, I didn't uh, really understand your question. Thank you. Yeah, maybe just to react to this, uh, to continue on the views of the different institutions. But I think that the, the court uh, is simply showing the way uh, to the institution saying, uh, listen, uh, these are values, define our common uh, uh, identity, and you have the obligation to defend them. But uh, the court does not uh, enter into the specificities of the various institutions, and I think it's perfectly legitimate that there are different approaches and different sensibilities. This is not the matter. What the, uh, the court here is saying is, uh, well, you have the tool. The point remains to be seen whether the... the <laughs> the institutions will have the courage to use the tool. Huh? So the, 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 the court can show the way, but cannot give courage uh, to the institution to use the, the way or take that way. And I think 
what the court is saying here is also in reaction to what we have been seeing in general that our supranational institutions are exposed by the need they yet uh, to step in uh, and, and take action uh, to face crises that uh, the political level was uh, incapable to deal with. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is the role of the ECB, this is uh, the role of the court, uh, and they were left alone on the front line. And then it's not surprising that then we end up with constitutional judgment concerning, uh, well, the stretch of the competence of the ECB in quantitative easing, or here these clashes, I mean, uh, the, the use of the judicial way to enforce rule of law via infringement proceeding, etc. Rule of law conditionality, if uh, is the polity that strikes back, if you want, because it's the first realistic attempt, at least on paper, we see on practice, for the political level to take action and re-enter the game, and we see where it goes. But I don't think that there was any normative intention for the court to, to say should have the same approach on this. And, and this uh, leads me also to the issue of, uh, of solidarity. I think that the, the, it's true the court is generalizing uh, the notion of solidarity, it qualifies a principle referring to this precedent, which was, by the way, a very interesting precedent. But uh, I would also tend to read this for the function it is in this judgment. I mean, in the judgment, the only function of solidarity is to establish that connection between the respect of the rule of law and the relevance that this may have for a, a sound implementation of the budget. And, uh, and uh, the court is not, uh, does not want to limit itself to a, a factual assessment. Yes, uh, uh, it is about fraud, but we want to also to, to save it from a, a normative level and say, yes, this is not just about the practical implication, but is a, 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 a value a construction that we have here. Uh, we can have uh, a, a transfer union, uh, a union where resources are transferred from, from a member state, only if then we, we can share the same values. So that's, uh, I think, the logic. And uh, I still have to react. It was not a question, but it was the intervention of Professor Repasi, with whom I don't agree on, on uh, um, Tracing back this type of conditionality to the uh, International Monetary Fund conditionality. I think we unfortunately here have a, a problem of language. We do have a notion of conditionality and we tend to stick it on everything that looks the same. But uh, they are very, very different things uh, because that is an external conditionality, the same as we had in the Memorandum for Greece, for instance, the conditionality for financial assistance to a third country. Uh, or to a member states in a crisis where well, we give money, you do what you want with the money, but we attach a number of conditions of whatever reason. Here, conditionality is embedded in the policy of the union. It's part of the policy choice to pursue an objective and has to be linked to that objective. So it is our common choice to go that way and to grant with the conditionality, let's say, guarantee that the policy will be enforced according to the common objectives. I fully agree with that. Yeah. I have the same view, yes. So I think we are far away from uh, EMF conditionalities or for, for the system we had uh, recently in the Union, but to support uh, the uh, Greece. Yeah. <coughs> I will, be, I will be extremely brief and pick up on a few points. Um, one is uh, something that Julio said, um, and I would like to push back a bit on, on that. That is that um, we always knew that Article 2 was cogn judicially cognizable and that, that that was always clear. I'm not so sure. Uh, if you go back to the 2000s and when well, the, the Lisbon... I, I, okay. I didn't say that. I, okay. at least I, I misunderstood. I didn't, I didn't misunderstood. say that. Okay, but it also links to what, what Carlos said. Indeed, Article 2 was first and foremost meant to describe the, the constitutional foundations of the union, not of the member states, mm -hmm. but where did these com common con uh, constitutional foundations come from, from the commonality among the member states. Um, so, but, but nevertheless, I do think that this judgment indeed is not meant to say anything about the democratic uh, credentials of the European Union. This is really about how you use Article 2 in relation to the member states. But then on solidarity, and I still feel that there's something weird with, and, and I fully agree with you, uh, that the, the use that the court makes of the concept of solidarity is making this link between 
if you receive uh, funding, then you have to have this budgetary responsibility, and that is based on <coughs> solidarity. I fully agree with you, but the court does something else, and it refers to solidarity as used in Article 2. So it's the Article 2 solidarity. Mm -hmm. It's the broad concept. And if you then take Article 2, because previously uh, we did not really have to read Article 2. Remember when Lisbon was adopted? Article 2 was something like, it, it was even a, a bit of a rest of the, the mm -hmm. remainder of the yes. preamble, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the values, that's not important, and then you go to the, to the text of the treaties. Well, now it, it, it happens to yeah. be the, the, the very identity of, of the union, but anyway. But if you read the text of Article 2, it uses solidarity in a way that I have apparently always misunderstood because it doesn't say, uh, it doesn't use solidarity as solidarity among the member states or between the union and the member states, but as a solidarity, as a society, it refers, it's in the second sentence, it says the, these values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between men and women prevail, which to me seems something, or I have always understood as something completely different. And here all of a sudden it is used to, to emphasize this solidarity between the member states and then tie it immediately to budgetary discipline. And that I find a bit difficult. And maybe even, well, a, a very generous reading of Article 2. And then on the constitutional identity and identity, well, I think that uh, Article 2 is the identity of the European Union. It is the basic values, the foundations that both the Union and the member states have to comply with. Article 4.2, there is, well, no, constitutional identity, there's many different concepts of what constitutional identity is, but in EU law, it is Article 4.2, right? And it is, I think, indeed, this general rule that as long as you comply with Article 2, there can be variations and diversity. Um, but it's not something that is to be unilaterally decided by the member states, and that is what the court keeps pushing back on against these member states. It does not mean that the, that the EU has nothing to say about how you organize your state internally. That is not, and that is what I what I liked in, you, in your one of your first comments, that it's in fact the judgment at the end of the day is about what it is to be an EU member state. And, and this is what it is pushing back. It's not as if you can decide what type of state you are. That is not what constitutional identity is about. Um, because over that constitutional identity, there is something more general. And that is the identity of the very union, which applies both to the union and to the states. Or at least that's how I have always understood it. That's Thank you. Yes, maybe we can take a question from the chat box. Okay, we have one. Um, how to reconcile politically Article 7 with the budget conditionality? How could we eventually assert shortcomings in the rule of law um, on the EU budget under the conditionality regulation and not act also under Article 7? Of course, majority thresholds are different in the two procedures but elements on the ground in member states are the same. This is the first one, and um, second one quickly. Since the EU has a story of crisis, do you think the terrible Russia-Ukraine crisis may affect positively the EU integration, not only hopefully in terms of company spending and enlargement, but also speaking about the rule of law? Since I think that Ukrainian people are fighting to defend the values of democracy and freedom, which are exactly the values contained in Article 2. Um, moreover, we are seeing that member states that have issues with the rule of law, like Poland, have now a pro European attitude and are welcoming refugees. It's too long question. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. I, I mean, the, the first one I think lends itself. Now maybe Professor Repassi wants to intervene because he he was uh, yes, waiting. Was <laughs> maybe we will start we start with him. Eh? I, I, I'm not being in the room. Uh, so how to reconcile <laughs> politically Article Seven with budget conditionality? Yeah. Was the first one? Yeah. Well, now I'm I'm quite reminded of my new task when I'm sitting in the trilogue and the Council and Commission don't want to hear what I actually want to say. So they push another question on me so that I stay on that one uh, in order to avoid what I might have want to say on conditionality and solidarity. But um, I don't want to um, escape this because we are in an academic setting. Um, 
Now, honestly, the, the questions that are now here uh, put forward, Article 7 and the, and the rule of conditionality, uh, the rule of law conditionality regulation, the court basically also gave a clear, clear answer to that. These are just two different kind of creatures. And uh, uh, I reiterate what I said initially, that the rule of law conditionality regulation is a budgetary defense instrument, which has, as was also earlier mentioned, a, a preventive character that uh, is meant to, to, to that the financial means given by the union to member states are used in a, in a, in a proper way. That can overlap with what Article 7 also wants to deal with. And here we are again in a very maybe unfortunate way of that the same terminology is used everywhere. So because in two different things the same word is used, rule of law does not by definition mean it has yeah, the, same, uh, the, the same meaning. So I do believe um, that you can very well apply the rule of law conditionality without having an Article 7 uh, all the way. Um, uh, yet, if there are shortcomings that you observe under the rule of law conditionality, uh, nothing prevents most certainly the Parliament to trigger Article 17 until the veto in the Council makes it impossible to go through. So, in that sense, these are just two creatures next to each other that might overlap, but at times also not. Uh, so, they can, can quite well coexist um, with each other. On the um, yeah, Ukraine crisis, this enters a bit more the, the field of politics than, than, than law, of course. Um, I believe what the person asking the question is, is rightly saying, um, let me put it like this. In 2014, when the Euromaidan came, people were waving the EU flags in Kiev. Uh, now, there's no EU flag to be seen by the Ukrainians. There was also a way of how the European Union dealt with its own values that the Ukrainians were believing in in 2014 on the way to now. So therefore, I think the one that's asking the question is totally right that Ukraine wants to be part of what we want to defend, a liberal democracy, because they share those values. Whether that internally means that we are going to have a push towards liberal democracy, I'm afraid that I have to, I have my doubts. And my doubts already start when we look at the, the discussion that I hear from the European Commission to actually release the funds from the recovery fund to Poland, which will hold back for rule of law reasons, because now Poland is doing a tremendous job in dealing with the, let's call it, re Ukrainian refugee crisis. So you see a certain kind of priority list made by the European Commission that now the rule of, internal rule of law issues they are subject to the war in Ukraine, which from a very pragmatic point no of view, you can find some understanding. But it basically runs totally counter the idea that the one who was asking the question was putting forward. Actually, in order to honor the, um, the, 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 the love, one could actually say, the Ukrainian people has for our values, we must continue with all what is in our arsenal against the rule of law violations that we find in within member states, if we basically want to keep up our credibility um, in this in this um, in this field. Thank you. Can I say something? Of course, for you. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, uh, I agree completely on the Article 7. It's a different procedure. Actually, the court says very clearly it has a different name. It's subject to different rules. It's autonomous from the, the regulation has a different name, autonomous and different rules from Article 7. This is why it's lawful. And, and this is the anti case law on which the whole design of the regulation was based from the beginning when we started working on it in 2018, yeah? Um, the same thing goes for infringement procedures. They are this, uh, uh, not connected, they are independent. You could actually have them side by side because they, they have, uh, all these procedures have a different name. Um, I want to point to Article 6.1 of the regulation, wh where it says that the Commission shall open the, com the procedure if it has reasonable grounds to consider that the conditions are fulfilled. And it says, unless it considers that other procedures set out in union legislation 
would allow it to protect the union budget more effectively. Uh, and now, which are these other procedures? It's not Article 7, it's not infringement, it's set out in union legislation, and this is the CPR, the Common Provisions Regulation, procedures in the financial regulation, contractual measures, in which the Commission can act alone as, man, as, 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 as manager of the budget and more effectively than in this a more cumbersome procedure that involves the, the Council. Yeah? So that's, that's for the one, first question. On the second question, I think it's too early to say how the Ukrainian war may affect a, 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 the the union in various terms, including for the rule of law. It's too early to tell. Um, because on the one hand, I mean, I think we are going from one emergency into uh, uh, to another. And in emergency times, we don't see the normal application of the law and the normal behavior of the institutions. We see an altered, uh, uh, um, um, a distorted uh, context. Yeah, so it's it's difficult to say in, in a medium term, how this will affect. Now, on the one hand, there is the refugee crisis and sympathy for the situation of the countries that are taking more of them. On the other hand, you could say, well, this is where rule of law problems lead you. I mean, because Putin's Russia uh, has these problems. And you know where this leads you. And so maybe you could argue on the other hand, this is the time to uh, uh, have a transformative moment to make all the countries of the union understand how important it is to have a functioning and solid rule of law. I, I, I would remind uh, all of you that there are two courts in, 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 in the Council of Europe that have declared uh, Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Inconstitutional. One is the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland, which, by the way, is not a court established by law, it, uh, unlike the German Constitutional Court. Okay? So I would not compare the German Constitutional Court much as one could criticize it with the positions of the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland. Uh, 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 and the other one is the Constitutional Court of Russia that uh, some years ago declared Article 6 inconstitutional. So, uh, again, I don't know, I, 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 but you can make both arguments, yeah? This is the time, or this is not the time because. Uh, uh, the other point I want to make is there is a lot of talk of sovereignty and European defense and the Macronian notion of European sovereignty which I think is not a real notion of sovereignty. Uh, uh, the European Union is only sovereign when it follows the path of integration. And it only becomes sovereign when it accepts majoritarian decision making. And a, a European sovereignty cannot really be based on the ju juxt juxtaposition of national sovereignties without creating something that is more than the mere sum of parts. Eh? And this goes for defense, uh, uh, and this goes for for uh, all the policies, actually. Yes, maybe if I can just add something to complement uh, on the first uh, issue of relationship between Article Seven <laughs> and and uh, rule of law regulation. I, I, I totally share what what has been said, but I would add something more from a political point of view, and in light of what I was saying uh, at the end of my presentation. The two instruments, yes, are different, uh, different object matter, different names, but they are also complementary in the sense that uh, I hardly doubt that, uh, okay, uh, Julio is right when say is not confrontational, this uh, rule of law regulation in legal terms, but I can tell you that in political terms, uh, seen from the perspective of the council is highly confrontational. To have a regulation, even if it is administrative or whatever, that there's a a clear time frame, time frame for adoption of decision. Uh, I mean, this is the big procedural difference with Article 7 that can last ages, no? And with a qualified majority and with very concrete and significant measure that can be adopted, well, it is clearly politically a, a confrontational object. 
So I hardly doubt that this can, as such, trouble uh, the uh, values uh, crisis that we have uh, at the Union right now. You, you need, you have the obligation, if you uh, want to be realist in your policy approach, to continue discussion and to find a way out. And then all the uh, Article 7 galaxy, I mean, not just the procedure, but all the different elements that have been put in there in the various years, I think they offer that kind of fora where this kind of political debate can go on, while at the same time, these instruments can be applied. But I think in this way, they are complementary. I think that it's time for me now to warmly thank you our, our four panelists for this very, very interesting contribution. And I will uh, suspend for 20 minutes the, the session until 4 and 15 minutes, please. And I suggest to have a coffee break all together. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Bye-bye.